One of the things I want to just do is to welcome those who are following online and say hello, and hopefully you're enjoying being able to see a few more of the screens and what's going on. We installed the new video mixer this week, so those are integrating, and for our online presence, you won't be able to see it here in the church, but online it should make a bit a more powerful and better uh, worship experience for you so hopefully that will be uh, for those who uh, catch it either live or uh, in, in recorded fashion so that's good and hopefully it's not being too aggravating for christopher so we'll see how that's working too uh, integration of different angles and stuff so it's really a, a it's mind-blowing uh, I just saw a post this week from my uh, former church up in Morganton, and uh, I feel sorry for them this morning. While we sit in this wonderful warm sanctuary, their heat is out after just being installed a few years ago uh, in the sanctuary. They said last week it was 58 degrees, uh, but they couldn't move to the fellowship hall because they had too much technical stuff to be able to broadcast. So they were some people could be in the fellowship hall, some people are going to be in the sanctuary, and then they said some people will be at home. So the things that COVID has taught us and done for us and the gift and burden of technology. So uh, uh, you'll be surprised. If you ever want to help Christopher, he's always looking for a, a good handy uh, a space bar presser or a sound mixer or any of those kind of things. So if you feel that call. Uh, without further ado, to the text which picks up directly, in case you weren't here last week, you got one verse of last week's scripture lesson. Uh, verse 21 was the one about Jesus, uh, today it's been fulfilled uh, in your hearing. Uh, and that was from last week. He read from the scrolls and then he was in, in the synagogue uh, teaching and uh, people are sitting there listening intently on what he says and then things go south. You know how that goes. You're like, oh, I like what they said until they got to that point. And then it went real bad, real ugly, real quick. And Jesus being Jesus recants and doesn't back down. It's one thing I love about how Jesus goes through his ministry, and, and I think I've observed it lately more than, than before, perhaps, that he's so determined and bounded to keep doing what he's doing. And he just keeps on moving forward in that journey, not giving up, even in the midst of all the stuff that's going on around him, keeps on because he knows the message and he believes the message and he trusts that God is uh, working through his work and through his presence in so many places and in so many ways he's teaching. But Jesus, Jesus is there in the synagogue and they say, Oh, isn't he good? Oh, isn't he so wonderful? You know, uh, sometimes uh, preachers, when they're starting out, go back to their home churches, and they get so nervous and uptight. And and you know, or you know, sometimes it's other things too. You know, it, it might be playing the piano, and you want to think about playing the piano in church, but you're so nervous that you're going to make a mistake. And yet, everybody in the room absolutely loves the fact that you can even play three notes on the piano that sound good. They're touched that you're trying to offer up what you got. And that's, that's, that's kind of the way it is. That, that, that they're, they're very impressed. Jesus is in his hometown. He pulls from the scrolls. He begins to teach. And he tells them what they, that, that, that today the Scripture has been fulfilled. And you're hearing, they've already heard the good stuff in the neighborhood about him. They've maybe read about him in, in the paper, the news source of the day. They know that he's doing good stuff and he's touching people's lives and he's teaching and they're impressed by it. And then they say, well, but isn't this Joseph's son? I mean, we know who he is. He's nobody special. Perhaps it's, it's interesting whenever we hear things that we love and we uh, appreciate, and then we find strength and comfort in that, and we, we you know, when those pats on the backs and those, ah, that a, that a kid. You know, those are good things. We think these, these are so talented. Oh, I'm so good. I'm so wonderful. And then it goes south when you kind of begin to push back on the norm or the common practices. This turned bad quick. It went from, oh, he's doing such a good job, but let's go kill him. I mean, in just a few verses. 
how often that takes place in the world. When we think about somebody's going to be something great, and just do something great, and then they go against something I've said, or something that, they, that, that you've thought all your life, and all of a sudden it's bad. It's real bad. I'm not even going to give you an example because I don't want y'all to get mad at me. But you know how that goes. Had a church member one time. They took months and months and months to decide if they were going to join the church. Preached one sermon, got a little cross with them. It wasn't 30 minutes after church they decided they didn't need to be a member of the church anymore because of something I said. How does that work in the world? Do you know how that is? There's something about knowing that you care about somebody and they care about you and that you can get together and be able to work through something despite differences. You know, used to, that's how it is. And I think perhaps, maybe, at least in the rumor mill, that's how it is in the South a little more than others has been historically. You know, they might, th they might not think right, but they're still family. And you care about them. But somehow, I think, and I'm going to go there just a little bit, that in our culture in today's world where we live and where we find ourselves, we begin to isolate and solo ourselves and our thinking and our understanding to narrow-minded thinking. On both, both sides, I'm not, I'm not pointing any... I mean, I think the left and the right and the, you know... We can just get so isolated and so unique that we begin to discount anybody else. I think one of the things that it's so important for us is that we've lost in our culture and our society the ability to challenge ideas. We begin to attack people as individuals and as living objects. It's not that their idea is crazy, it's everything about them is horrible. And if there's anything that's ever more contrary to the gospel, that's it. Your ideas can be whatever they want to be, as long as they're not too out there to hurt me or to hurt another person. I mean, you can possess and walk around with some not-so-good ideas for our culture or society, but now that goes a different story when you start talking about let's just get rid of them. These people who heard Jesus, the very Son of God, begin to teach and to understand who God is and to begin to, 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 to exemplify that and to show that to the world, to teach the world who God is through Jesus the Christ in their midst, began to take, take, uh, they begin to take action against Him. Not just, no, we're going to shut you up, you need to be quiet now, that's enough. My mother ha does this to me once in a while. Oh, I know, she's one, of, she's one of our viewers on Sunday sometimes, or at least she watches it afterwards. So I know, hi, Mom. You know, and I'll get fired up about some stuff once in a while, and I'll be talking to Mom and Dad, and Mama looks at me and she says, you just need to be still. It has nothing to do with it. I, I don't need to, she didn't tell me to be quiet. She tells me to be still. I'm like, I'm just talking. I am still. She's like, you need to be still. But what a powerful image of that, to be still. To wait, hold up, think about it. What powerful advice. But I don't, I, I, I don't think I'd, I... I might think an idea is completely ludicrous, and there are several floating around these days. But I'm not willing to stone somebody over it or to go get them, beat them up, break in. Ah, that's not what we're about. But it's exemplified here that those who are religious leaders and people who practice the faith 
were willing to throw stones at Jesus? I mean, we see this throughout all of Scripture, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, I mean, we hear about Stephen, the martyr. I mean, there, there are a lot of stories about this throughout our culture and throughout our history. Jesus isn't alone. But you know, when you begin to, to, to twist and to turn and to show light onto the established patterns and processes, people get their dander up pretty quickly. I kept thinking about that. You know, Jesus somehow walked through. Well, there's a whole lot about the explanation, but that he just left, he just went on through, and kept going. He just kind of got away from them. But he didn't spend a lot of time after that in Nazareth, his ministries of Galilee, and, you know, that's where he taught. And he just kind of left them in his hometown to do his thing. I thought of, in this time, there are times in which uh, Peter gets out of some kind of close situations kind of like this. And I thought of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. You know, I, the, the Anglican Church rolled out the red carpet for John Wesley to bring about his reforms. I'm glad Bob's laughing. He's paying attention to me. He knew what was going on, too. Wesley was never welcomed in the Anglican Church. He, was, he died an Anglican. But he, he, so he was never Methodist. He, he, didn't, he didn't really get excited about we were having a new denomination called Methodist. You know, that's really a derogatory remark, don't you? I mean, it's not like they liked us. I'm glad they picked Methodist over the Bible bigots. That was one of the other ones that was alternate uh, option for the, the, this brand of Wesleyan followers. Chose Methodist because of our methods and our regiment patterns. We're so methodical. But John Wesley, John Wesley was not welcome to Anglican churches. In fact, what he was saying about Anglicanism and the church was so kind of upsetting to the towers that be that they, they, they limited his ability to preach and to teach in their churches. They ran him out of the pulpits. He just wasn't able to speak. That was in England. He'd already gotten run out of Georgia. So he, 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 he did not, I mean... Bless his heart, he just couldn't go anywhere. John Wesley took up the pattern, the pattern and practice of, of what he called field preaching. He would go into places, especially in, in middle-class London and, and lower-class London, and he would get into the field and start preaching. They had a traveling pulpit even. They had built it up. I've seen it. Uh, there's a couple around that were his and, and part of the pattern. And there were these round, kind of big drums, and they would carry them with handles on the side of them, and then they would plop it down in the field, and he'd climb up on top of it and start preaching. These sermons with sentences that must be 18,000 syllables long. Today, we were like, how can the world, could, could commoners relate and understand? And he did that. Oh, it goes on, and he, he begins to, to, to kind of needle the church into doing something different. He talks about like, like going to the prisons and to visiting and prison reform and to outlaw slavery and, and, and the education of children. I always love this thing. He said he had some preachers that wrote to him and said, well, we're not real good with kids. What are we going to do about that? And he said, well, you're going to do it anyway. Get used to it. Do it. Whether you like to or not. John Wesley, John Wesley, you know, a lot of Methodism was originally funded by the sale of a medicine textbook that John Wesley had written. A medical, like home remedy. There's like a, like a, like a formula for how to keep your hair in there. All these things that, that he was, you know, that's where a lot of the funding came from for Methodism. They began to feed the poor and offer medical care to people. Oh, I can see where Methodism, it wouldn't be real popular these days if we did it like Wesley. Nope, nope, not going to. Feeding people, medicine, taking care of folks, we're not going to do that. 
Well, it come to pass that Wesley kept on preaching outside. It began to get to the point where um, people would try to break up his meetings. Uh, there's an account from September uh, the 12th of 1742. So this has been a while back. And I'll just read it to you from, from what's recorded in his journal. All of a sudden, I got a lot of volume. Uh, <laughs> I didn't quite mean to get that excited. It's Wesley's journal. It's not that good. <laughs> This is the quote telling a little bit about what happened that day. He was out at, at, between Whitechapel and Coverlet Fields. Many of the beasts of the people, ah, you know, many of the beasts of the people labored so much to disturb those who were of the better mind, him, of course. They endeavored to drive a herd of cows in among them. So can you imagine that? Got a group of people out in the field, and they just begin to push cows into the field to try to get dispersed, uh, to disperse the, the people. He writes on, but the brutes were wiser than their masters. He's giving the cows credit. So they don't, they don't move. The, 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 they kind of just kind of get around them. But anyway, so finally they decided to, that the unmotivated cattle, they began to use a more manageable weapon the traditional stone. So John Wesley writes, One struck me between the eyes, but I felt no pain at all. And when I had wiped away the blood, went on testifying with a loud voice that God hath given to them that believe not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. John Wesley gets hit in the head with a rock and he keeps preaching. I get scared to death y'all going to come after me, but I, I, you know, it hadn't happened. Thank goodness. But if you start throwing stones at me, I'm out of here. Don't try it. But yet, Wesley keeps on. And it, this had already happened. This was September. And in January, there's another account where he got th thrown stones at because of what he was preaching. And yet he managed to keep doing it because he understood what God was calling him to do and to change England and teaching of the gospel. Despite, despite being, being challenged, despite being shushed, they kept going. Part of this love and hope and grace, it changes our life and it changes the way we live. It changes our willingness to keep going into the world, in the world that's hurting and in a lot of pain. A lot of suffering. A lot of, lot, of, lot of just negative talk, shall we say. False information. And I love that part from Wesley where he talked about, but the spirit, not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. They prevailed. Sometimes when we hear all this craziness, we've got to be still. Wait just a minute. Keep going. Know that God's on our side. Know that what we're doing is scriptural and is empowered by God through our baptism and through our place in God's church. And we go forth into the world to make a difference for others as we can. We can't fix everything, but we can change some things. And little by little, the kingdom of God is revealed in the world and where we live and in our life, and others' lives through us. Oh, don't give up. Don't, don't let the negativity get to us. Hold fast our faith, trust in God, and allow God's way to be ruling in your world and in your lives. Oh, glory, honor, and power be to the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen.